we've been talking about how even though we're in a time of waiting for what's next, it is in fact an active time, a season for us to be considering, assessing, discerning how we can listen for what God is calling us to do right now, the ways he's prepared us for this time specifically. It reminds us of the wonderful passage of Philippians 3.12. Not that I have already obtained all this or have already arrived at my goal, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. So how do we take hold, grasp what God wants us to do, how we are to live right now? The passage today, you may have remembered hearing before in relation to finances only, but it truly relates to every gift, every talent, every opportunity. So let's with energy and expectation, take a look at this practical parable and what the Holy Spirit is saying to us this morning. Jesus said there was a master who was going on a long journey and he distributed his own wealth, his gifts to three servants, according to their ability. Then he left, and when he returned, he called for an accounting for what they had done with the gifts that they, he had been given to them. Let's walk through this passage together. Matthew 25, 14. For it is if a man going on a journey summoned his servants and entrusted his property to them. Notice that everything that they are given actually be belongs to the master. It's not theirs. There's just stewards of it for a while. To one he gives five talents, to another two, to another one, to each according to his ability. And then he went away. The word talents actually referred to a fortune in that time. The point is they were given fabulous assets that the master entrusted to them while he was gone. Obviously, we instantly see parallels in our lives. Everything that you and I have really belongs to the Lord. He has let us be stewards, caretakers of it until he returns. It's all really and truly his, not ours. He gives us the resources and then he leaves. Not clear how soon he'll return. And then he went on a journey. The one who received the five talents went off at once and traded with them and made five more talents. In the same way, the one who had two talents made two more talents. But the one who had received the one talent went off and dug a hole in the ground and he hid his master's money. Notice that the gifts aren't the same, but they are exceedingly generous, and the master carefully decided who should get what based on their ability and circumstances. But it isn't more money or assets for themselves. God works just this way, doesn't he? He gives to us generously, but he doesn't coerce or force us to make the right decisions. He gives opportunity, and then he leaves the decisions in our hands. Verse 19. After a long time, the master of those slaves came and settled accounts with them. Then the one who had received the five talents came forward, bringing five more talents, saying, Master, you handed over to me five talents. See, I have made five more talents. His master said to him, Well done, good and trusty servant. You have been trustworthy in a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. And the one with the two talents also came forward saying, Master, you handed over to me two talents. See, I have made two more talents. His master said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been trustworthy in a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. Then the one who had received the one talent also came forward saying, Master, I knew you were a harsh man, reaping where you didn't sow and gathering where you didn't scatter seed. I was afraid. And I went and I hid your talent in the ground. Here you have what's yours. Now, why do you suppose the third servant mishandled his resources in this way? Well, for one, he was afraid. He really didn't understand the master. He didn't know him. Maybe he thought he couldn't make a big difference with what he had, especially compared to the resources of the other servants. The, sir, the third servant misunderstood in another way. He said that the master harvested where he had not sown and gathered where he had not scattered seeds, that he exploited the works of others. But the first two knew that the harvest is the Lord's. We may be doing the work, but it's God who plants the seeds. 
Whatever his reason, he did nothing but hang on to what he had. He didn't lose it, but he didn't use it either. Here as we continue in verse 26, but his master replied, you wicked and lazy slave. You knew, you knew, did you, that I reap where I do not sow and that I gather where I did not scatter? Then you ought to have invested my money with the bankers, and on my return I would have received what was my own with interest. So take the talent from him and give it to the one with ten talents. For to all who have, more will be given, and they will have an abundance. But from those who have nothing, even what they have will be taken away. As for this worthless servant, throw him out into the outer darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Strong words, uh, aren't they? Especially when we realize that this parable, this clear direction of how we are to put, use our resources, applies to us, to you and I, right now, this week, today. God wants to reward us, and he will reward us when we put the talents he has given us to work. God doesn't look at how successful we are. He looks at our effort with what we have been given. God wasn't concerned with the size of the accomplishment. He just wanted his servants to do something with what they were given. To know this means that we don't need to fear failure. First of all, he saw the master as a hard man. He was afraid if he failed, he would be in trouble. He was unlike the first two. They knew the master was merciful. They knew they could take the risks. We can be so afraid of blowing it, failing, disappointing God that we hold on to what he has given us rather than using it but we don't need to fear failure. What are some of the things that we are managing for God? Money, possession, time, abilities, spiritual gifts that God himself has given to each one of us. We need to first understand that God has determined what you and I will be responsible for, and that we need to believe that God has given you what is best for you and that we're supposed to use what God has given us for God's purposes. Not just to store it up for a rainy day that may or may not ever come, or to make us feel comfortable or secure. We weren't given whatever is in our in individual or church budgets for our own security. God calls us to invest in the spreading of the gospel, the building up of his kingdom. For instance, look, at, look with me at this passage from Luke 12, where Jesus is speaking. Then he said to them, watch out, be on your guard against all kinds of greed. Life does not consist of the abundance of possessions. And then he told them this parable. The, cert, the, gr the ground of a certain rich man yielded an abundant harvest. He thought to himself, what shall I do? I have no place to store my crops. Then he said, this is what I'll do. I'll tear down my barns and I'll build bigger ones. And there I will store my surplus grain. And I'll say to myself, you have plenty of grain laid up for many years. Take life easy, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, you fool. This very night your life will be demanded from you. Then who will get what you have prepared for yourself? This is how it will be with whoever stores things up for themselves but is not rich towards God. In a legitimate, legal, honorable way, Jesus is, in fact, the ultimate insider trader. And his insider knowledge as the Lord of creation is this. The market's going to crash sometime for you, for me, for us all. The only sure thing, the only wise investment is using the resources God gave us to serve the Lord. So this parable acts as a warning and an encouragement. The kingdom of heaven will be like a master going on a journey. That's Jesus. Jesus is the master. 
the parable centers on him. But ultimately, what does this tell us about Jesus' character? According to the third servant, Jesus is the harsh and hard man, profiting, great in labor, and taking what doesn't belong to him. Wow, and this is who we call our Savior? But that description isn't true. Are you tempted to believe this, to be anxious about how Christ will respond to you? Purportedly, the third servant is so fearful that he may lose what Jesus gave him that he buries the talent and returns it exactly as Jesus gave it to him. The master, Jesus' reaction, is serious for sure. It might make us pause and wonder if we accept this servant's earlier assessment of Jesus' character, hard and harsh. It's anything but encouraging. This is a parable, and as there is so often in parable, there are layers in this at least one part warning and at least one part encouragement. Let's be clear, the Lord we preach about each Sunday, the one we serve, doesn't look anything like that third servant's description. And it's important to remember that Jesus is the one telling the parable to take these words seriously. This parable is not a story of a Christian who comes up short on Judgment Day, who didn't have enough return on Jesus' investment to make it into heaven. The servant isn't a follower at all. He's a pretender. Because where in his story is the evidence of any faith? Consider, the talent he receives represents all that God has given him, all that he is. Think about that for a moment, just whatever comes to mind for you. His abilities, his resources, his time, his money, his energy, his affections, everything. So over his entire lifetime, this servant invests none of it none of it into the kingdom, nothing beyond himself. It's not that he only invests a little bit of it in the kingdom, it's that he invests none of it. He buries the talent and doesn't give kingdom work a second thought until the master returns. He didn't do, even do the easiest thing just to put it in a 1.08% interest savings account. He has no kingdom interest at all. Secondly, the facts that he represents reveal he doesn't know who Jesus is and his words slander Jesus' character horribly. He calls Jesus a hard man who steals to enrich himself. He tried to shift the blame to Jesus for his lack of using his talent. I didn't just invest out of fear of you, it's your fault. Okay, so those all sound like warnings. And here's where the encouragement comes in. Scripture gives us plenty of examples of how Jesus is awesomely, amazingly giving and generous and gracious the penultimate of dying on the cross and giving his life for us. He forgives us and receives us into his kingdom, not as servants, but as friends. He gives us a place in his family, not as slaves, but as daughters and sons. And then he gives us talents, some more, some less, but all of infinite value, all uniquely precious. And then he rejoices with us, rewards us, for the returns we offer him on the talents he gave us in the first place. So Jesus is saying, if you want to know me and my character, I'm warning you, don't listen to the third servant. He was a pretender and a slanderer. The parable warns and encourages us to check out who we really are and what life is really supposed to be about. That's useful always to consider and review, but more acutely now. This short parable contains an overview of our lives, what we were created to be and do, what we should invest our lives in, what life is really about. It's a soul-searching parable. How do we measure life, the meaning of life, the purpose of life, and the definition of a successful life? Secrets of the Kingdom, this parable reveals, has to do with that big question. What is the ultimate purpose, meaning, measure of a life? It's what matters to the master. It's wrapped up in our kingdom service. This parable is found immediately following the parable of the 10 bridesmaids about keeping watch and vigilant and, and right before an end times parable of the separating of the sheep and the goats. It's all about what are we supposed to do? Simply really, but what are we supposed to do with what we've been given? So remembering that context at the end of our lives, when we stand before Jesus to give account, Christ won't ask us how much money we made, 
or how comfortable we were or how high up the social ladder we climbed. The Lord will ask us what we did with what he entrusted to us. But what does this mean in this strange time? Sometimes we're feeling empty and listless inside. If we're super busy, the answer might be to slow down and to get refreshed. Mm -hmm. But if we're doing very little and we're feeling dis disappointment, discouragement, frustration, and drag, what we probably need to do is get busy, creatively busying ourselves in service for the kingdom. There is a weariness that comes from not being busy and a joy that comes from serving the Lord. And what's more, it's what we were created for. The master gave talents out differently according to their abilities, intentionally, perfectly suited for each. In the parable, we're not all equally talented, but if we're faithful with what we've been given, we equally can please the Lord. Mm -hmm. The amount of responsibility that they were given was in accordance with their abilities. The, the Lord gave five talents to some, two to others, ones to others, and the hows and the whys of which shouldn't be our concerns. We shouldn't compare or be jealous. There is actually, when you think about it, no way to compare since we don't know what other people have been given as gifts. Mm -hmm. The Lord offers us an interesting perspective. Life isn't measured by how we compare to others. It's not a competition. While Jesus in the parable didn't give them equal amounts of talents, he did give them equal amounts of praise. He was as pleased with the servant who doubled the two talents as the Lord was with the one who doubled five talents. So we can easily imagine when the master asked the third servant why he didn't take the small step of investing the talent in the bank so at least there'd be some interest, that it is believable that our Lord would in fact have praised that servant and rewarded even a small step of faithfulness in exactly the same way. Evidently and surprisingly, the Lord sees things differently than we do. We get it into our heads to only think about like big name, high profile Christians who by appearances seem like they're really working for the kingdom. But we've missed something. We've missed something in appreciating those who serve and love and give and invest in obscurity in all of their lives. Those who invest and give in such small, unimpressive, perhaps, ways to us that they may even wonder at, at the time if their lives are making a difference at all. They may even confess that they don't think their lives are having any kingdom impact at all. But they are. More than they know. And Jesus is pleased more than they can understand. Each of us, I think, will be very surprised on that day when Jesus honors those who served in small, obscure ways, never really thinking that it added up to much. Be encouraged. Yeah, let's commit. Let's commit to investing in kingdom work. Let's pray. Let's work. Let's share. Let's think that in spite of all of the apparent obstacles this season, that the kingdom isn't on pause. Even when we feel like nothing is happening, God knew the pandemic was coming and gave us just the right gifts well ahead of time for just the right time. So let's have faith that God can use us, each of us, to make a difference for the kingdom. Be encouraged. A lot of that will be small things that don't look like much to us. So that we aren't living in a raw truth that we did so little with what he gave us, that we expect whenever we see him that he's gonna say, that's it? That's all? 
but we will be delighted and surprised instead to hear him say, well done, good and faithful servant, enter into my joy. And we'll realize again, and maybe finally, since it's standing in the kingdom then after all, that it's always, always been more about him, his grace, his love, his kindness, his com encouragement, his fierce advocacy over us than it's ever been about us. Because that's who Jesus is. So what does investing in the kingdom even mean for today, this morning, this week, this future? It's investing the gospel of Jesus in the lives of people. Jesus came to seek out and to save the lost people. The only thing that can transition us from this tired old world into the kingdom of heaven is people. God has given you certain talents, personality, gifts, resources, spheres of influence. Use them to spread the love of Christ. Use them to witness Jesus' generosity and generous character and gracious character. Use them to be his hands, his feet, to the hurting, the broken, the outcast. Invest them to help people to come to know Jesus. God has given you the ability to pray, and, and the Lord hears us. Pray for the pe people to know Jesus Christ. Do daily kindnesses. Share compassion. Think of others well beyond just your own family and friends. Think of others beyond yourself. People, entering the kingdom of heaven is what the kingdom of heaven is all about. It's why Jesus came. It's why he sends us, you, and I, all of us together. For the gospel's sake, with a new vision and passion, and to God be the glory. Amen. Amen. Well, we'll see if we can hear ourselves. After my...